Hi, I'm Robert Hurt, and I'm an astronomer and visualization specialist at Caltech IPAC. And today I'm here to guide you through part two of our tutorial on using version 4.0 of the FITS Liberator program. Now in part one of the tutorial, we went through the basics of the interface, how you open and save files, how to use elements of the toolbar. For part two, we're going to focus on this section of the interface, scaling, and a way of handling dynamic range and images. This is the real power of the FITS Liberator because it has some functions that are very easy to use here that aren't found in a lot of other software, even professional software used by astronomers. Well, I'm gonna to return to the Galaxy M51, uh, the same spiral galaxy we looked at in the first tutorial, but I'm going to use a different data set for this just drag and drop it in using that style of the interface. This is an infrared data set uh, from NASA Spitzer Space Telescope. Many astronomical data sets, when we say they have high dynamic range, what we really mean is that the range of data values from the very faintest parts of the image to the very brightest can be factors of 1,000 or, or 10,000 or more. Now in photography, there's a concept of high dynamic range photography where the idea is through a very powerful camera or through a series of bracketed photos, you can build an image that has really preserved all of the information from the darkest shadows all the way through the brightest highlights. Well, many astronomy data sets do that quite naturally because the telescopes themselves are designed to basically track every photon that comes in and not lose any information from the very faint to the very bright side of what's going on. So, in order to turn this into a pretty image that looks more like a galaxy, we're going to have to start dealing with the dynamic range. Now, a basic thing you might try starting off with is simply to go to the histogram and drag that white point down so that you might be able to see more of what's in the image. And sure enough, that does bring up some of the faint side of the image that's lost, but it does so at the expense of clipping the bright features. And that's not something that we really want to do. If we turn off our clipping warnings, you see something that really looks burned in, contrasty, and you've lost all the detail in both the dark and the light side. And, and that's not pleasing. So let's go and find ways to manipulate the data before we display it. And that's where the scaling function comes in. What we want to do is basically take that raw data from the telescope and apply a mathematical function that rescales the numbers in a way that the brightest parts don't get bright as quickly before we display them in this gray ramp from black to white. Well, the simplest thing we can do is something called a power law. And that just basically takes the data value and applies an exponent to it. And uh, one example of that is taking the square root. Uh, to take a square root of a number, that's the same thing as raising the number to the power of 1 half or 0 0.5. So you see we have an exponent term here and let's just enter 0 0.5 for square root. And then we apply to the image so the FITS Liberator knows to recalculate the numbers before displaying it. And sure enough, this has actually shown us more of the data. It's, it's gov given us a much better picture already. Now, uh, I would have you notice that the histogram has actually changed as well because this histogram is dynamic. The histogram is calculated after the data in the image has been scaled using whichever scaling function that you're applying. Now, uh, that is handy because as this histogram spreads out, that starts to show you visually that more of the dark highlights are being pushed up and becoming brighter in that rendering as a grayscale image. And so that's really what we want to see. But of course, right now we're clipping a lot of the image in the black end. So let's go ahead and pull that black point down so that we're not losing that data. Now, this is definitely improved, but it isn't as good as we might want. So let's go instead of a square root and maybe do a cube root. That's the same thing as raising the data to the power of one third or 0 0.33 approximately. So let's apply that to the image. And now this is really starting to look nice. This is starting to look like a galaxy. Uh, we have not lost the brightness that occurs in the center part of the galaxy where you have the densest collection of stars. So uh, this is really giving us the kind of uh, final image that we're gonna want to be able to see the faint structure without 
burning in the highlights. Uh, we can just go ahead and pull the white point up a little bit more so that we really see how sharp the brightness is at that central peak. And let's maybe apply a slightly stronger expo exponent. Instead of um, a cube root, how about the fourth root, which is uh, the power of 1 fourth or 0 0.25. Apply that to the image. And then we really start to see all of the faint extended regions around this galaxy that were really lost in the earlier versions. I'll turn off our clipping again. There is something weird occurring, however, if you look at this histogram, you see that there's a sharp dip in the histogram that pops back up the other side. And in the histogram, we see that there is this, um, this there's a, uh, a green line, uh, a green marker that occurs right in the middle of that line. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we go to the options page, we actually get a color key that tells us what the vertical lines in the histogram mean based on their color. And the green marker is the scaling background level. So what does that mean? The scaling background level is basically where does the data go to zero in the, uh, in the image before we apply the scaling function. Typically, that data value is at zero, but the Fitz Liberator lets you actually set what value in that data set you want to be the zero point for the scaling function. Now, what does this mean practically? Well, that means that if I actually say I wanted the square root function not to be referenced to this part of the image, but maybe a darker part of the image, I can just drag our, my histogram out to a lower black level, and then I can use this little button on the side of the background level field to pull that number straight off the histogram and fill it in here. Now, why do I do that? Well, it turns out that the way the displayed image looks is strongly dependent on where you choose the zero point of the data. So let's go ahead and apply to image using the same exponent. And now we see that this is actually starting to look a little smoother. Uh, the data still dips down right around the background level, and that's to be expected because a root function sort of works very aggressively as you get close to zero. And it, uh, it, it gives you this um, spread of values around either side of that. Uh, I'll turn the black clipping on. You can sort of see that uh, these numbers down here, the, the uh, darkest parts of the image, get very, very dark. And if we actually expand the histogram to include them, it really actually makes the, it, it washes out a lot of our features. That's not really where we want the black point to be. So for a practical standpoint, you might want to experiment a little bit with exactly where you set your background level, pull that data from the histogram, and then try reapplying the scaling until you get something that really hits the right stretch that you want. And this is starting to look pretty good. Uh, in general, you do not want to see any weird fluctuations in this at the point where you're trying to see something in the image. And that's why it, it's okay down around the zero point. Uh, you know, if we go ahead and blacken the image a little bit, it's, it's giving us a really nice effect. So that's basically how you apply a power law. And in um, image processing terms, that's essentially equivalent to applying a gamma function to the image. So there's another function available in Fitz Liberator for handling the dynamic range of an astronomical image called the ArcSync, or A-S-I-N-H. This is short for the inverse hyperbolic sign. It's a mouthful, but it refers to a simple mathematical function that around zero acts very much like a linear function, like very little transformation at all. But as you get to larger and larger numbers, it begins to act logarithmically. And a logarithm is a function that actually turns entire orders of magnitude, powers of 10, into even ticks. So it's a very, very powerful function for handling extremely high dynamic range images. So how does the arc sync actually work from the context of the Fitz Liberator? Well, if we apply the arc sync and do nothing to adjust the initial guesses, we might get something that in fact looks a whole lot like a linear function. And that's because the arc sync is a function that is very heavily dependent on how the data is scaled before you apply the arc sync. So to give us the ability to adjust this very carefully, the Fitz Liberator 
has two extra settings that we need to use for the arc sync. In addition to the background level, which works very much like it does for power laws, you have a peak level setting and a scaled peak level value that you select. So the peak level is something that you will choose based on how you want your data displayed. It's not, it doesn't have to be super precise, but generally you want to set that to the brightest thing that you want to show in the image. Then you can click this little selector and it pulls that out of the image. And then the scaled peak number tells how that data is to be rescaled before you apply the arc sync. So if we set leave the scaled peak level at one, that simply means it will rescale your data. So the black part of the image, the zero point will be zero and the brightest part of the image will scale to be one. And when you do that, like I said, you get something that looks essentially like a linear transform, like you've done very little to the data at all. But the magic comes in when you start increasing the value of the scaled peak level. If we jump from one to say 10 and rescale the data a little higher before we apply the function, we see some of that detail in the image starting to come out. You'll notice the histogram begins to spread out. Let's take that data set and then rescale it so the brightest part of the data is now at 100. Apply that to the image. And again, now we're really starting to see the full range of information in the data set. I think we can pull it up another power of 10. Let's bring it up to 1,000 and apply that to the image. And now this is fantastic because we're really starting to see the fine detail, all of this faint structure that exists around the outer edges of the companion galaxy in M51. But it's also really nicely separated and delineated from the dark background space. So this is the power of the arc sync function that basically the value of the scaled peak level, you can think of that as the amount of dynamic range compression you're getting, that you will be able to see features 1,000 times fainter if you set it to 1,000. If you set it to 10,000, you are actually bringing up the detail and features that are 1 10 thousandth as bright. Uh, and if you're really interested in the faint structures, maybe you really want to push it that far. You actually start to see there's whole features out here we weren't seeing in the other uh, stretches before or we weren't seeing with the power law. But if you're more interested in sort of the beauty of the galaxy, the central galaxy, maybe that's a little strong. Maybe you want to go back down to 1,000 and apply that to the image. And then you get a um, hint of the faint structure going out here, but, but you have something that may be more aesthetically appealing. So this is your free parameter to fine tune, and it may be very different between different data sets. Uh, it turns out that the arc sync also does depend on where you set your background level, because the zero point that you choose for the data is subtracted out from the data set before you apply the arc sync. But because the function, the arc sync function is almost linear through the zero point, it doesn't really strongly affect the look of the data depending on if, if you change the background level a little bit. Notice if I pull that out a little further, reset the background level here, reapply that to the image. The image look doesn't change. And in fact, that's because the data is ha being handled very linearly through this point. So that's another advantage to the arc sync. You don't have to be as precise with where you've chosen your background level to get really nice uh, effects out of it. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you have fun playing with the Vitz Liberator using your own data sets.